This conversation is brought to you in part by Calavo Growers, the family of fresh. Hey there, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Happy September, October, November, December, whatever day, whatever you're listening to this, I don't really care. I cannot even begin to tell you how thrilled I am with the guest I have to bring to you today. We have a living legend sitting here hanging out with us, somebody I've known for a very, very long time, one of the all-time great doctors in this country that is making a difference on a global scale that is going to blow you away. Sit back, tell your boss you're not feeling good, chill out, whatever it takes, but listen to this episode, write some stuff down, make sure you know where the website's at, because you are going to enjoy yourself. This is going to be a big, big source of inspiration to a lot of people, and I'm thrilled to have him. Please, everybody, give it up for my friend, Dr. Alan Green. Alan, thrilled you're here, brother. Oh, Todd, I am so thrilled, my friend, to get to be with you, plus to get to be with your audience, but especially to be with you. It's just great to see you. Thank you, my friend. I, I'm just, I'm, your work, your body of work is just, it's, unbelievable. It's just mind boggling what you have done for this planet and what you continue to do, especially for parents and kids. It's, you know, you're a pediatrician, you're out there making a difference. I cannot wait to dive into all that you have going on and inform these folks what drgreen.com is all about. I'll say it again, drgreen.com. Say it one more time, drgreen.com. Okay. I got the first, first three shameless plugs in. I'll keep you. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> but we should mention that it's D-R-G-R-E-E-N-E, e. right? E, yeah, E at the end. I forgot about that. Thank you. Yes, it is. It's E at the end. And that'll they, they, get lost. Yeah. They, yeah, they will. Well, you know what? We got it on the backdrop and we're going to promote the hell out of it. They'll, they'll know the E's there, believe me. I love it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your trajectory, if you wouldn't mind. Just give everybody a quick little synopsis of your bio and who you are a little bit. And then I'm going to dive into the 9,011 questions I have. That sounds like a good plan. So, so yeah, I've devoted my life to kids' health. Uh, started on a service trip. I was in Guatemala, which was its own long, longish story, but saw that it was really important for the health of all humanity for the kids to get the best health. And i tell you one really quick story. When I was in medical school, I decided to go to medical school. I did pre-med at Princeton. I went to UCSF. And while I was there, I was taking care of an elderly woman who mm-hmm. had crippling osteoporosis. And I really like to get to the bottom of things. So I tried to figure out what can I do to make a difference for her? And as I took a deep dive and looked into it, I was shocked to learn that osteoporosis is a pediatric disease. It's kids. So all of us lose a little bit of bone density every year. And sure. there are some things we can do to, to change that trajectory, some. Um, and, and especially great exercise is, and great nutrition are things that will work. But the big question for osteoporosis is how much bone density you build between 10 and 20 years old, approximately. That's where the die is cast. And I thought, we're getting at this way too late. And so I looked, what do they need? And they need to be getting enough calcium and vitamin D and not too much soda and sun exposure beyond vitamin D and weight bearing exercise and all these things that most American kids weren't doing. Right. Most had suboptimal vitamin D, suboptimal calcium, not enough exercise, too much soda. And so then I went on to the next rotation and saw cardiovascular disease, which starts in childhood. And cancer often has its roots in childhood. And just so much uh, macular degeneration of aging has its roots in childhood. So mm-hmm. I devoted my life to kids' health. Wow. Locally and around the world. I bet there's a lot of people that have no idea. I bet there's a lot of people that are going, I did not know that already. We're, we're one minute into this interview and they've already gone, I wrote something down, which I freaking love it. I absolutely love it. You launched drgreen.com back in 1995, and it is an unbelievable source for parents, caregivers, whomever wants to learn a little bit more about kids and get a deeper dive and a clearer understanding. The American Medical Association called it a pioneer physician's website. I mean, it is absolutely so chock packed full of information. I don't know how you and I don't know how you and Cheryl manage that thing. I don't know how you keep that thing going because there is so much you can go from literally from baby to to teenager to everything in between and everything that's involved in between. Why did you decide to create it based upon that you know story you just told about yeah. the about the lady so, help? 
So you are right, by the way. Cheryl is the key person. My wife, oh. she's the executive producer who makes it all happen. Yeah. I wanted but, her to come on and not you, but I couldn't get that away. Uh, she's tough to get. She's, I know. Really, she's, she's good, to, too. She's right. got big agents. She's got bookers and agents. I, she's, it's a process. But the way this got started, I was in a typical or fairly typical pediatric practice in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, when I started, the, tr the, the pace that most of my colleagues were keeping and that I kept was to see three patients an hour. They give you 20 minutes with them. And, and that was a pretty good visit, felt like. And yeah. then the, this was the time when managed care insurance came kind of steamrolling through the Bay Area. And they, our medical group required, we see four an hour. And that little shift was a huge difference in the depth you could get into with people. Yeah. And then they said five an hour. And then they said six an hour. And I was exhausted and racing and felt like I couldn't explain anything. And the, the families were complaining too. They said, we love you, but we, your hand's on the doorknob when we get in. How, how do we, how do we uh, change this? So I talked to some of my colleagues and other physicians I work with and said, I think we should do this brainstorming session with the families and see if we can come up with a brand new way of doing things. And I was told, absolutely not. Do not do that. <laughs> Two problems. One, if you mention this, they'll know we have a problem. And if you're quiet about it, they'll forget there's a problem. And two- Great strategy. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's for it. And then two, anything that patients come up with will be not feasible. It just won't work. They don't understand, have what they need to understand. So Cheryl and I started having secret meetings at night with families, patients, and said, hey, we got a problem. How do we fix this together? And, and it's true that some of the things they came up with, like why don't you just work 24 seven, were not feasible. But what did emerge from those discussions was, was how about we do a website? where we could put our questions up and you could give us really in-depth answers. So many of them are the same. And th this is 1995, right? So this is before Google. This is before WebMD, although eventually we became the pediatric arm of WebMD for a while. Yeah. Um, it was before, I mean, it's, it's before Wikipedia. And, and so we decided, and, and according to the AMA, this was the first physician website in the world. We just had yeah. to be in a spot at the time. We said, okay, let's do it. And uh, so we applied for a grant from an old company now called Silicon Graphics. And they did, gave out two grants that year to us and the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, to improve the environment. And we said that children are the leading edge of the environment help us do a website to teach people about kids in the environment. And so we won the grant and it was just equipment and training. So Cheryl uh, learned how to use this Silicon Graphics uh, workstation. And, uh, and we put in two exam rooms, a little physical paper business card and said, any questions, drgreen.com. Yeah. And it was just for my patients. And they loved it. They thought it was the, they, they felt like we now have so much more of your time. So if a kid had an ear infection, they would read what I wrote about ear infections first, about what caused them, about what to do about them, how to prevent them. And before they came in, and then we, our visit could be tailored to exactly their situation. situation. Right. Instead of the same shallow cross over and over and over, we get the causes and solutions and, and deep stuff. So it was fantastic. Problem was, they started telling their friends about it. And so I would get these questions coming in from friends of families and Cheryl would write them back and say, I'm sorry, you should talk to your doctor. They would write back and say that our doctor is too busy and isn't online and please help, help. And I still said, I can't do that. I don't want to steal patients from other people. I, 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 it's, I don't have a relationship with you. Yeah. And um, then people started pretending, parents started pretending to be my patients. They would write in and say, hey, my name is John F. And uh, our dog bit our kid. And we need to know it's on the hand. Do they need antibiotics? And I knew that John F. didn't have a dog. And then right. this bell kind of went off in my head. Parents are so desperate at that time 
for information they couldn't get anywhere else, that there's a, there's a real unmet need here. And so we closed my practice to new patients, so I couldn't be stealing anybody's patients, and said, okay, we'll just answer one question every night that comes in that's representative or something they can't find elsewhere. And within 12 weeks, we had <laughs> 250,000 people from six continents who came and started following and getting involved. And this was, there was no advertising, no, uh, no PR, no marketing. It was just people found there's this doctor online willing to talk about real problems in a deep way. Thanks for joining the Todd Versation. And now a word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Nelia Alamo at Calavo. Thanks for listening to Todd Versations. At Calavo, we are the family of fresh. For almost 100 years, our passion has been bringing delicious and nutritious food to your table. From tasty, wholesome produce to our freshly prepared foods, Calavo is a global leader in the finest quality produce and a pioneer of healthy, fresh cut fruits, vegetables, and prepared foods. Whether it's our farm fresh avocados, tomatoes, Hawaiian papayas, or chef-inspired solutions, including fresh-cut fruits, veggies, guacamole, and much more, Calavo takes pride in delivering our fabulously fresh products every day. It's our promise from our foodie family to yours. Check us out at calavo.com and learn why we are excited about your fresh possibilities ahead. Unbelievable. You know, there, there's no, there's, there's, I don't think there's, well, there, there is, but it, a parent that's scared about their kid's health right. is a very desperate position to be in. Indeed. It, it really, really, I can relate it with my kids, you know, and, 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 you know, at 1230 in the morning, trying to find an answer. Right. Then was, you know, what you're going to go to the emergency room. No, that's not where you want to go. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, so it's amazing. I, you had to have some responses from parents that just absolutely touched your heart though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, putting it in context, my my yeah. goal with every answer, I would wanted to give them the best of my wisdom as a parent and as a doctor who'd seen thousands of patients already at that point, and the latest studies. But to get the latest studies, I couldn't get online and get them. I had to no. physically go to a medical school library to pick up the paper journal and thumb through it and find the study and bring, I mean, it was, it, and, and patients weren't allowed in medical libraries. Uh, so it was yeah. really taking the hidden gems and getting it out in public. That's now so common that you, that you can do, but yeah, people were so grateful. The, the one that really blew me away. One of the first ones was somebody who wrote typed in and said, you know, dear Dr. Green, um, I have walked three days from my village because I heard there is a doctor on the internet and I have a question. I hope you will choose. And I will sit here um, for several days, hoping you choose mine to respond. And wow. So India. And, uh, and just the, the desire for parents was so deep and, and, and still, and last week, somebody came up to me on the street that I didn't know and asked to have a selfie together because when their kids were young, um, they they had asked questions that were their answers were so helpful to them. And now their daughter just had a baby and wanted to get her connected. And it was it was just really sweet. You got groupies. Yeah. Small, I love it. A small number of, of groupies. But, for, 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 you know, what an honor, though. What an, I mean, you know. Talk about something to reaffirm your life's calling. And I want to ask that question because I, you say that Dr. Green, with an E, everybody, dot com <laughs> is your calling. And I believe that it is. And I've known you a long time. And I mean, I've, I, I, I have watched your trajectory. And, you know, obviously, I'm a giant fanboy. So I'm, I'll quit gushing over here in a second. But explain, <laughs> explain what that calling meant to you. Explain that, that, that moment, that epiphany where you just felt like, man, I have found my path and there's plenty of lights and I am off. So there were a couple of, of little ding moments that led up to it. The first one I mentioned was when somebody pretended to be a patient. I got that people really want information. Sure. The second one was I was trying to bring somebody with me into a medical library to look at some studies together because I couldn't check them all out and I couldn't get the patient in. This was shortly afterwards. And, uh, and, the most people don't know this, but the Hippocratic Oath, the thing that mm -hmm. doctors take, uh, most doctors don't know this, but at its core, if you ask somebody, what's the Hippocratic Oath, they'll say, first, do no harm. 
And that's in there, but that's not the oath. The oath is, I swear, it's a secrecy oath. I swear that I will teach other in the brotherhood about this and their families, but nobody else. I will keep this knowledge secret. And if I do that, I'll be blessed. If I share it with people, I'll be cursed and I'll be ethical. I will first not harm people. I will do the best job that I can. I'll behave uprightly, but I'm going to keep this stuff secret. So they depend on me for their access to healthcare. And, and I, and I, I got that that was sort of built into the system. And I, started writing because this is the end of the 20th century um, yeah. lineal health oath that was exactly the opposite that I promised to teach everybody as much as I can possibly about our bodies and how they work and how they're connected to the rest of the environment around us. And so the, the moment that it um, that it really hit was we're about 12 weeks in. We had this map up on uh, at home where we put push pins in where people were answering at sending in questions all over the planet. We'd hit six continents then, not seven, uh, although we eventually did get people coming from Antarctica. Cool. I turned, turned to Cheryl and said, I can't imagine feeling more fulfilled than this. This is just so exciting. It is so fun. We're at this moment in history. And it was the next day that we found the uh, cancer in her breast. Yeah. And it was March 22nd in 1996 that her doctor said, there's not a chance that it's time to go home. And um, she's not going to survive this year. And you should make final preparations. Yeah. And my first thought was to shut down the website and shut down my practice and move in with family and just be together. And she said, no, don't you see? This is the moment you have to get as much out there as possible. I want you to double down on how much you're writing and how much you're answering. And, um, and it clicked to me that if I won the lottery, most people, if you win the lottery, you're going to keep your work. No, they're going to go enjoy if they suddenly get wealthy. But if I win the lottery, which I did when she recovered, or if I lose the lottery, like I thought that I had, the thing I want to do in my life is to break the Hippocratic Oath every single day by getting the word out there to people about, to inspire people about their own health and their kids' self. Unbelievable. Well, you know, you and I walked that path together. We, yeah. Um, good, yeah. In, in my own life here, I mean, it was fairly simultaneous between the two with the exact same thing. Right. That, You've got less than 10%. I, I remember being told by the surgeon with my wife, go to the cave of the Lords in France and pray. That was literally his advice. It's like, what, where, what? I don't think France is in my book. I don't think I have time for that. It's parent mode. I don't think two young kids, no family around. It was, yeah. it was life-changing. And I know, it, and I love what, I love Cheryl saying double down. And by the way, Cheryl's in the background and I know Cheryl's in the background and it's 2022 and I'm, and Janine's in the background and it's 2022. So uh, yeah, right. Yeah, on. But absolutely. You can't, until you walk that path, you can't, it, it's really hard to share that experience with people that haven't walked it because it's a feeling, it's, it's a feeling that I hope nobody ever gets in their life, but it's and one, yet, that's one of the things so different focusing and powerful too. I mean, I don't wish it on anybody, but I'm no. so grateful for it. hundred percent. There's, there's, you ask my kids what we went through and, you know, we really believed in, in everything up front with them. There was no, there was no, you know, did we call, did we call them driving home from the doctor? No, but we talked the moment we walked in the house, right? I mean, there was nothing that we left behind. And I think that was really a big thing for us as a bonding experience as a family, because we have that, that need to communicate at, at, at a very high level, mm -hmm. but, you know, and, and then having to gone through it again and I, you know, and with my son, with what he did with 17 with brain cancer, I mean, it's like, I know I've done the game and I get how this game is played. But what I'm interested in is what did that teach you, not only as a doctor, but what did it teach you as a parent and as a person? And how have you applied that to your life? Because that's what I think is a big takeaway that people don't recognize that cancer does for people. It's the takeaway that it gives them that changes their trajectory. Yeah, it, it was very life changing for us. So, so really, the reason that drgreen.com has continued for all of these years and our work around the world that's continued for all these years is that focus that it's not about, um, we, we, there's so many things we could have done that would have been more lucrative than this, uh, but we just want to give it away as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, so, so that focus has been really powerful.
beyond that, the value of community really came into focus. <clears throat> yeah. When I got home from the hospital. There was a, a meal sitting on our doorstep. And I just thought that was so sweet. And the next day there were more meals and the next and the next and the next. And for an entire year, it took a while before we figured out who they came from. Um, and it was the nurses in the labor delivery part of the hospital who all love Cheryl and, and, and both of us. And they just took it upon themselves to support us through this year. It was really powerful. And still Huge. community is really central in our lives. Um, Another thing that was really powerful was um, with, starting with those food. But I, uh, that first night, Cheryl turned to me and said, our, our youngest was nine months old and was breastfeeding. And I turned to me and said, what formula do we feed him? She had to stop. She kept nursing through the biopsies, even an open biopsy. But then once the diagnosis came back, she said, you know, she had to stop. And I up to that point in my career, told everybody breastfeed. That's the only thing you should be doing. And all formulas are the same, doesn't matter. I couldn't turn to her and say that, right? I, I, she couldn't breastfeed. And to tell her all formulas are the same would be irresponsible. So I decided mm -hmm. to do a deep dive there and looked at the differences and, and learned that they're really different. And some are, really, yeah. some are not really good. And, and, uh, and, and so that got me thinking more about nutrition and, I suddenly noticed that in the questions that had come in from all over the world, parents were asking about food, but I hadn't been answering it because I just was blind to it. Yeah. And I thought that this, this instinct we have to feed our children right is deep. And it, it's right that it's deep because it's so important to their health. There is nothing more central than how we teach our kids to eat. Um, what everything you see when you look at your child is built out of food that they've eaten or you've mm -hmm. eaten, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. it comes from it comes from food and all that they do, their energy, their memory, their brains, all of it's built from things that come from food. Uh, so I, that became really central. And then the other thing that became really central was trying to figure out why did she get this? There was no family history. Um, what is, was there some kind of thing that might have caused it? And she grew up on a farm. And in looking at possible exposures, I learned that there was a pesticide that the closer you uh, a woman lived to that in their childhood, the higher the risk of breast cancer. And it was sprayed right outside her bedroom window throughout her childhood. Yeah. And, and I hadn't learned anything about pesticides or environmental triggers in, in medical school. The evidence was there. It just wasn't part of our, our process. And so I that changed that trajectory too. For sure. And, and it and you were really one of the first that started banging that drum, talking about that and getting it out there in the public eye. And you've written two amazing books. And I want to talk about both of them. I guess we'll do it simultaneously. First okay. one is it, we're talking about is feeding, feeding baby green. And the other one is raising baby green. And it really talks about exactly what you had spoken to about food is medicine. And yeah. it can, it can, it can heal you and it can kill you. And as you can, it doesn't take much, you know, you can walk through the mall on any state in this country and go, food is medicine, food is going to kill and food is helping. Right. And it's, it, yeah. we need to be really cognizant of that. Can you talk a little bit about that a little bit? And, 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 and really, I, I want to kind of lean into the environmental exposures that kids get and how it does, like you were talking about with Cheryl, with, you know, living on the farm and, and how that kind of correlates together with stuff. So kind of a big softball question multiple direction but you can handle it and you'll roll with it i know that we'll have a good time so so yeah every bite of food is either an investment in our future or it's a new debt we're taking out that our body's going to have to pay back somehow or another beautiful and uh and you know one bite here or there is not a huge difference but the compounding over time it can become this massive credit card debt in our in our bodies or it can become this trajectory towards health and a long and, and a productive life and brain and everything. So, um, so two things that, that feeding baby green was about is one is helping people to understand what great foods are. And yeah. then the other was how to teach kids to fall in love with them. Uh, Cause it's one thing to be able to, people who are watching this, I'm sure pretty well, uh, have a, a sense of what great foods might be, but uh, there's a lot of people who know that and don't enjoy them. Mm -mm. Uh, they, they would enjoy something else more and they do it because they have to, and to make it to help, especially when you start young, uh, it's easy to really easy to teach kids to, to love the great stuff. 
And in a, in a tiny thumbnail, what the way that babies come out is with, with their taste buds. Anything that is sweet is likely to take good, tastes good because anything in nature that is sweet is likely to be a good source of food for us. Mm -hmm. um, anything that tastes salty, in they come out liking. But anything that has a bitter note in it, they are from the gate suspicious of it mm -hmm. um, and afraid of it. And that's good because most bitter things in the planet are bad for us. They're toxic. There are a few like vegetables that are awesome for us. And, and mm -hmm. early on that the says, don't like it. Same as first trimester of pregnancy, bitter stuff tastes terrible when you want to protect the woman. Um, and then things that are sour also they're suspicious of early on because anything that's sour might be spoiled, like spoiled milk or something like that. So right. they don't like bitter or or sour flavors at the beginning. But if they get exposed the right number of times and the right uh, at the right critical windows, then there's some a switch goes in their brain and think, oh, my parents meant for me to eat this bitter combination. This is good. And now on, I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the early studies was done with, with uh, kids who were taking solids. They were six to nine months old. Um, they asked the parents, what is the, your kid's least favorite food um, that, of everything they've tried? Number one answer was peas. Uh, and uh, among babies, they said, nobody liked peas. So they said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to give one tiny bite of peas, first bite of solids every day for a week. And if they make a face, don't try to get them anymore. If they ask for more, fine. But just, just one bite is their first bite. And at the end of one week, just seven more exposures, 85% of them loved peas. Yeah. It just switched. It wasn't hard for them. And it wasn't hard for the parents. It was easy to do. They, and, and for 70% of them, at the end of that week, it was their favorite food. Um, Unbelievable. When it, when it switches, it switches. And, and there's a, a bunch of moments where that, where you can do that in, in different ways. How, how much, you know, with formula, and you touched on a little bit earlier, how much does formula uh, affect a, a young child's palate to command? Because formulas, you know, it's sugary, right? It's carbs, it's carby, it's sugary. Yeah. And, it, and how much does that, do you think, affects the palate of a young child to where they're resistant to not like, to your point, something that is bitter, a vegetable might have a little bit of a different flavor to it. You know, case in point, think about a broccoli, whatever, you know, comes up. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're like, you know, no, I really don't want that. I'd really rather have the sugary, sweet, you know, instead. Yeah, it certainly can imprint kid. We call this taste imprinting. It can imprint kids on very sweet flavors and one flavor. Breast milk is a different flavor every time a kid drinks it. Um, right. and flavors that mom drinks uh, while she's nursing come through. And so, for instance, there was a study done with those uh, uh, exposures with, with moms who didn't like carrots, didn't eat carrots. But during nursing, they were given carrots or something else, uh, a shot of carrot juice or a different juice 12 times during the first six months while they were nursing. Those babies, when they had their first bite of, of carrots, all the ones whose mom had had just 12 total servings of carrots liked it on the first bite. They recognized it. And the ones who didn't, not a single one did. It wasn't too late. They could still do it in that next phase, but it, it just all this stuff worked naturally before there was a processed food aisle. Kids just learn to like what their parents like, and you didn't have to think about it. Yeah. But yeah, formula is one flavor every time. And so you need to tap into other ways of doing it. And if you do use formula, look for one that's sweetened with lactose. Uh, lactose is what breast milk is sweetened with. It's there for early on. People are, are now afraid of it because of lactose intolerance. Whatever babies typically are not lactose intolerant. That's what breast milk is sweetened with. There is this lock and key where the breast milk is lactose. Babies have this enzyme specifically during infancy to be able to digest that lactase. It's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's what the mom is giving. And it's not just moms, it's every mammal. It's every ape and primate and every mammal. It's lactose is what's there. And the idea that we come along and use corn syrup in a, instead or or sucrose, table sugar instead in the formula to me is just crazy. It's After nuts. Tens of thousands, hundred thousand years of doing it one way that our bodies are built for. Well, I mean, look, look at diabetes, you know, look at obesity. Oh, yeah. I mean, these are all facts. I mean, and, and, you're, and you're literally planting those seeds in young children. Right. If you're not making a conscientious choice, I want to come back, swing back around a little bit to, 
environmental exposure with kids. Yeah. And I think, you know, and because my assumption is, is that your studies over these years, you probably have a, an opinion of 10 years ago might be different than your opinion of environmental you know, exposure today. Can you touch on that a little bit? Because I think it's just fascinating when people hear what's really going on out there. Yeah. So one of the, the early things for me, again, after doing all the reading I could after what we went through with Cheryl, um, I did some work with the Environmental Working Group, PWG. Go and Ken we, Cook. Go Ken, Ken Cook. Cook. Yeah. I love Ken. I do too. And um, I was the physician on a study that got a fair amount of press. Um, the, the, the headlines were mostly born polluted. And what we did back at that time is we we took a sample from the umbilical cord blood from babies and just did a complete chemical analysis to say what is in here. Nobody had ever done that before, and we were surprised and not surprised to see that we found a total of 287 industrial chemicals coursing through babies' blood at the moment of birth. So they had been getting that. that the womb had been thought of as the most protected place, right? Where you're, you're so protected from what's going on outside. But no, the we are part of the environment. The things that are in our environments end up in our bodies and in our children's bodies, even our unborn baby's bodies. And we didn't know what those things meant. We knew that some of those things had been proven as neurotoxins or endocrine disruptors, but this was just at the beginning. And, and it's not just babies. We, we did, I did another study with them where um, with teenage girls and the, uh, the personal care products that they use, that they put on their skin or that they brush their teeth with and took the list of all those chemicals and everything that was in their personal care products when we drew their blood, we found in their blood. So it's going into the body, not just on the skin. And the more we look, the more we find sometimes subtle and sometimes significant impacts from, from those exposures. Um, let me think offhand of, I mean, we know that chlorpyrifos, one of the organophosphates causes neurodevelopmental problems, ADHD right. in some kids, <clears throat> excuse me. Right. And one of the studies I thought early on that was interesting was with the weed, uh, weed killer atrazine, mm -hmm. at, um, very widely used. Some researchers in, I believe it was Korea, looked at the maps of obesity in the United States and saw that it roughly matched the maps of atrazine use. And so they thought, that's interesting. Let's do a little study. So they took animals and the animals had the same exercise, the exact same diet, the same exposure in the room. The only difference was a tiny a bit of atrazine in the water that they drank, the same amount that's in the groundwater in some parts of the Midwest. And they found that the ones who got that were obese. They had wow. extra fat and the other ones didn't. So I mean, our diets are, 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 are central, but just the, the pesticides too can impact weight. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's it's so shocking. And now, you know, let's let's get the big elephant in the room is microplastics now, where we all right, have right, right. We're, we're, we all have a visa card running through our bloodstream at this point. Yep. <laughs> and and that's going downstream to the kids. And and what what amazes me, Alan, and I got to be honest, it's like we care, but we don't care enough. We don't care enough to find out ways to solve this stuff. Yeah. And since back then, we've learned a lot about something called the epigenome or the epigenetics, where you turn right. on off different genes, and those are heritable. And so if we have switched our genes around to deal with these obesogenic plastics, then the next generation is born um, expecting that's the right way to be. And it takes work to undo it. It could last two, three, four generations. You know, as a country, you know, when you think about penicillin, polio vaccines, surgical advances, Western medicine taking on all the things, we've really doubled down on just throw a pill at it more than we have looking at our diets and, and, and taking control of that and, and managing that, especially with young children, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, at the level of what are we really feeding these kids and why are we asking tougher questions? And, you know, and I understand, and I want to get into the economics. That's not, it's not at play here. I don't believe, I think it's really about more about common sense, but you know, how much more should we be investing in our diets and be thinking about that? And how do we accomplish getting to that point with people? Yeah. So first what kids actually are eating in the United States. And uh, I should say, I, I love cutting edge medicine. I think there's great things. I think antibiotics. Absolutely. 
best inventions and in all or discoveries in all of human history, but they are wildly overused and misused and not good for us direct. In fact, antibiotics in agriculture are used to fatten up cattle. Yeah. And that works and also fattens up kids. There's research about that. It messes with the microbiome, this entire environment that we have inside our bodies. But what are kids actually eating? Uh, the USDA did a study where they, as part of the food pyramid guide, where they looked at what kids are actually eating and listed it in order um, over what they eat between two years old and 18 years old. So pretty much all of childhood and list them in order of how much kids are eating of them. And mm -hmm. they, they published their top 25 list. And there is only out of the top 25 foods that kids eat, there's only one vegetable on the list. And that vegetable is French fries. Yeah. And there is only one fruit on the list and that fruit is apple juice. Yeah. And we are missing out on so much and and it is having a health impact. So let me tell you, when I started in pediatrics, I was and I was concerned about building these great organs and systems to last for a lifetime, it was really rare then to see a child with high blood pressure. It just rarely happened. I mean, it was not common. And today, oh. as we're talking, there are millions of children in the United States with high blood pressure. It was rare back then to see a, a kid with a waist size over 40 inches or, or high blood, I mentioned high blood pressure or blood sugar that's elevated, let's say had like childhood diabetes, rare right. to see cholesterol up or triglyceride up. And now two thirds of American high school students already have at least one of those middle age conditions. And all of it is influenced by how they eat. How they eat, yeah. They eat. And what? all of that, yeah. So if, how much do we invest in that? We have this metabolic and economic ticking time bomb going off right now. It, it is, it's slow moving, but that, that train is moving the wrong direction. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and, and it's, I'm so thrilled again, that you're here and to get this message out to people to make them kind of wake up and realize that while we think we make good choices, that drive through is not really your best choice. And right. we need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about how that affects kids at such a young age. It's such a deep dive. And I, what do you think holds, what do you think is holding us back from making better choices? Is it convenience? Is, I you know, I can't imagine it's finances if you're driving through, you know, uh, you're driving through someplace. I mean, is it just lack of education to, to parents, to, to young parents, to people, you know, where is that disconnect? There's several pieces of it, I think. One is that there's much less cooking at home than there used to be. And people just tend to eat better if there is a home cooked meal around a table together. Um, it just happens. And we have the family meal table is gone in a lot of places and home cooking is gone. It's it, you know, cooking at home is ordering in from... Or dash, yeah, or dash or whatever, right? And, um, and so that that's part of it. Part of it is that we have a generation that was imprinted early on on the wrong stuff. So that is their comfort food, uh, and it's a big problem. And we have this food culture where you're surrounded by foods that are engineered to hit exactly those combinations of salt, sugar, and fat that are craveable. So yeah. there's a lot that's going on there. But I'm also encouraged. I, I, I know many families that are making family meal time a priority, even better making cooking together a priority. Um, anything that kids are involved in cooking, they're more likely to want to eat um, and growing food and more and more people are growing food. So, so there's this growing group of people that are getting it really right. Um, so the, the nation as a whole, we've got some real problems, but there are so many bright spots. Well, you, you know, and, and I'll lean into one right now. Definitely, you know, and as I call it now, it's COVID. It's not COVID anymore. It's COVID. I'm yeah, I'm trying to trying to change a little bit, make it a little bit softer, maybe. But you know, <laughs> COVID got us eating at home. COVID right. changed yeah, a lot. Right. Yeah, right. And you take a look at the stats. You take a look at the data of what was being eaten at home. Yes, you had chips. Yes, you had cookies. Right. I mean, that's but part of do. it. Oh yeah, right. Fruits and vegetables were up. And one of the big things I keep harping on is that you know we were given this this amazing opportunity to help people eat better. And now that COVID is slowing, you know, it's going away and people are driving through and eating out more often, we're getting away from that. So I've been trying so hard to encourage my peers and, and the industry itself to say, you got to keep leaning into that. You've got this nice yep. lift. It, you're you're going to literally piss it away if you don't pay attention to it, because people are going to go back to where they were. And right. that I don't want to see happen. 
I am totally with you on that. And it's such an opportunity. And yeah, the data is clear. People ate more fruits and vegetables. And when you look at the, at the coronavirus, all other things being equal, the people who have um, better micronutrients, the people who have better controlled blood sugars are less likely to get sick and are more likely to get better faster and to have less of a real problem when they do. But food 100%. really matters in, in that. It's not a guarantee that you won't catch an infectious <laughs> disease, but it's one of the biggest things that we can do is to give people great nutrition. And well, I mean, the data supports thing. it though. Right. Yeah, the data supports it around COVID. I mean, our, our, you know, that, that, you had a high level of obesity that had you know problems. You had lack of vitamin D. What is what is it? Seventy. I'm trying to do the number on my head. Was it over seventy four percent or is it eighty seven percent people yeah. vitamin D deficient? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot. What has COVID taught you? What What is the experience over the last years? Because I mean, that had to be obviously for any medical professional it had to be a, a tad cray cray. As the young kids <laughs> yeah, say, more than a little cray cray. <laughs> as you would imagine, parents have been concerned about, about a tad this, the whole thing. So questions all the time. So for me, that meant being a step ahead of every study as it's been coming out pre-publication and 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 talking with people, thinking about things, and um, and I think one of the biggest things that it's taught me is that even though that particular problem is an infectious disease, that getting great physical activity, eating real whole foods, not ultra processed foods, um, getting good sleep, uh, having social connections, which is harder right now, and yeah. having mental health are so powerful, whether the threat to our body, whatever the threat is to our bodies, it, 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 it helps us be much more resilient. So it's made me double down on my appreciation for food and for avoiding unnecessary chemicals. Thanks for joining the Todd Versation. And now a word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Nelia Alamo at Calavo. Thanks for listening to Todd Versations. At Calavo, we are the family of fresh. For almost 100 years, our passion has been bringing delicious and nutritious food to your table. From tasty, wholesome produce to our freshly prepared foods, Calavo is a global leader in the finest quality produce and a pioneer of healthy, fresh cut fruits, vegetables, and prepared foods. Whether it's our farm fresh avocados, tomatoes, Hawaiian papayas, or chef-inspired solutions, including fresh cut fruits, veggies, guacamole, and much more, Calavo takes pride in delivering our fabulously fresh products every day. It's our promise from our foodie family to yours. Check us out at Calavo.com and learn why we are excited about your fresh possibilities ahead. It seems like this is a complicated conversation, but if you actually listen to your words, they're all really simple answers. They're all right in front of you. They're all choices. You go into a grocery store with 50,000 items. There's a lot of really great choices. There's a lot of bad right. choices. There's a lot of really great choices. And it's a matter of just taking that deep breath going, I'm going to be cognizant of my good choices today. Yep. I love it. One study I should mention real quick, yeah. um, just a couple of years ago, it was done with flu vaccine. And so what they did is they wanted to see if sleep had anything to do with the vaccine response. And so they actually measured people's sleep with a device that would track how long they were sleeping every night, looked at the six days before, and they compared the ones who got at least seven and a half hours of sleep per night and the ones that were sleep deprived. And then they all got a flu shot. The ones that had good sleep for the six days before had twice, had double the antibody response. And there's very few things in medicine where you get, you know, you get a 7% increase or 12%, but a hundred percent increase in their antibody response. And if you got the shot and slept great for the next six days, it didn't do much. It was beforehand. And wow. so if somebody is going to get a vaccine for something, then sleeping before makes sense. But more than that, if you're going to get exposed to something, sleeping before makes sense. Sleeping just makes sense. It makes our life better. Uh, it's it's it can, it's just a, such a simple conversation that we just continue to screw up as a society. It, yeah. It's crazy because it's all it's it's the way we're programmed, right? It's the right. way we've been created. And I think that we get away from that. Right. And I think people don't understand how big the benefits really are. They, they think yeah. that yeah, get, get, being well rested is nice, but it's not nice. It's incredibly powerful. There is no medicine as good for Alzheimer's prevention as frequent heart pumping exercise. Works better mm -hmm. than any medication. Yeah. Well, I mean, and look back that with sleep and food, and you're great. Well, look at the evolution, right? I mean, think about this. 
it, the evolution of man, you were up with the sun, you went to bed when the sun went down. There was you, right. what do you watch? You were watching TV, you were walking yeah. around the streets with street lamps. I mean, it was what it was. You certainly weren't cruising around outside back there because you didn't know what was around there in the dark. You right, see. Right. right. So, I mean, it, 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 our bodies were created with that logic. Yeah. And, and in ways, we're still discovering. I've got a, a friend, a colleague at Harvard, a guy named Steve Lockley, um, helped dis- discover and characterize in, in our eyes, in the retina, there's rods and cones, right? To, mm-hmm. to see color black and white. There's another receptor um, called melanopsin that's only recently discovered. And that detects blue light um, and sunlight, particularly, and blue skies. And the receptors are in a gradient in the back of the eyes. So our bodies are aware where the sun is in the sky and starts to change our hormone levels depending where how high or low the sun is. And we didn't even know there was a receptor for that before a few years ago. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's crazy. I mean, what a great conversation. What do you think? Because you know, we're going to wrap up our time a little bit here. What do you think the most common parenting misconception is today that you see? Well, I'm I'm skewed a bit, and that I do tend to see a yeah. lot of Alan. Yeah, we're all skewed at our age. Yeah. We're all skewed. That's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from things we've talked about, one thing that I see so often is this idea that, say, a fever or other symptoms are bad. And if we treat the symptom, that makes it better. When really the fever, it it is a sign there's something going on, but most of the time it's there to actually accelerate the healing process. And you'll Mm -hmm. get faster if you don't decrease it too much. Decrease it to sleep, or if you're not able to drink enough, or or if they're really uncomfortable, but but we we wanna work with the body. Vomiting is to get rid of stuff, and diarrhea is to get rid of stuff. Wheezing is, is there to protect our lungs from toxins in the air. Right. You know, when the uh, when the big fires came in Northern California, most of the urgent care centers were saying, you ought to take your inhaler if you ever have wheezing, open up your lungs. And it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. If, for kids who have asthma, they should be inside um, and turn on the HEPA filter and don't do vigorous activity for a few days till the air quality gets better. Right. Wheezing is a protective mechanism that humans had to protect us from smoke, from fires. Well, give me a same same vein, same kind of question. What do you think is the one thing you wish every parent would uh, strive to do better today for their kids? I mean, one thing's tough to pick, I'm sure, but if there was something, you could you know wave that yeah. wand. That that's a tough one. I know. I would hope that parents would take a moment um, before the baby's born, when you can still sleep a little bit, but at least every year after that, and all the way up to our kids' ages now. Yeah. To take at least once a year to stop and reflect, what do I wish that I had known at that age? What do I wish my parents had known when I was that age? And um, what can I do to move in that direction? There's so many things that, oh, I wish I had known that then, that I want to really impart to my kids. And I wish my parents, my parents were great, but there are some ways that I wish that they had handled differently. And I want to be that kind of parent. I, I yeah. want to capture those lessons. Yeah. Well said, sir. Well said. I didn't get into, I didn't get into the fact that you created TikTok. You want to talk, tell it real quick? I think it's just hilarious. <laughs> People don't realize you are the original guy that created TikTok. This is true, but it's not the one people are familiar with. This, wow, it's a, be- it's a better one, that's for damn sure. <laughs> this one is pretty amazing. It stands for um, Transitioning Immediate Cord Clamping to Optimal Cord Care. Correct. And the basic idea there is that um, at the moment a baby's born, there, there is a circulation that's been going through them throughout, throughout pregnancy. And the moment they're born, about a third of their blood is still outside the body. It's outside their body and through all of human history and every culture ever studied. Once the baby was born, people would watch and see the cord start to pump and it would pump extra blood into the baby. They would get extra oxygen that would protect them through the golden minute and help them before their lungs open all the way up. They would get extra iron enough to prevent 90% of iron deficiency anemia, which is a huge health problem. They get extra red cells like they were getting Lance Armstrong blood pumped into them. Um, they would get extra white blood cells that reduce the number of infections in the first year. And they get stem cells that are, are lasting. This, this is something people bank because they're so valuable. 
And we started in 1913, immediately clamping, locking that stuff out. It was a crazy idea and so easy. Just that if even an extra 90 seconds of waiting before the, the actual fast clamping gives kids such a gift. And it's not just us, every primate waits. And it's not just that, every mammal waits. There's no animal that actively severs the cord before it stops pumping. Dr. Green, folks, with the knee. Dot com. Todd, it's what's so good to be with you. Yeah, my brother, I appreciate you. Like there's no tomorrow. You are such a force of nature out there making such a difference on this planet. I, if we could clone you, we, I would love it. You're clonable. There's not a lot of people on this planet that need to be cloned. You're clonable. Well, hey, that's what the new thing we're working on, by the way, is. Uh, so one of the things we've done for years is uh, we, Cheryl and I have taken care of this little village in Costa Rica. Uh, we were asked and we're invited to go down there uh, by a guy you may know, Drake Sadler, uh, yeah. who, who said, hey, doc, there's this village of people that had never seen a doctor before. Would you be willing to come check them out? So went down fabulous time. And we're going back every six to 12 months and checking out the families. And, and it turned out some of them had seen a doctor before, but still it was a useful service. And, um, and then when, when the pandemic hit, couldn't go. And so we started doing it all by telehealth, started doing it all with tools we could check from here. And that worked even better because I was there, not just every six months, I could be there whenever. And so that has been so successful. We are now, and so many doctors say, hey, I wish I could have a village so I could help out. I, I want to make a difference. And so many villages say, hey, I wish I had access to healthcare. There's 5 billion people on the planet who can't connect to healthcare in, the, in a right. meaningful way. So we're starting to play matchmaker and to help folks who, uh, who uh, healthcare providers who would like to make a difference and places that really need it, to hook them up with it, introduce them to each other and teach both sides how to make the best use of that, how to, how to, uh, how to do it. I love it, man. You're, I tell you, you're clonable. You're a force with nature. I just absolutely, uh, it, it's, an, it's an honor to know you. It's been an honor to know you. And I just thrilled that you're here on this broadcast for people to hear your message. Dr. Green with an E.com. Don't forget, with an E, everybody. I said it again, Dr. Green.com with an E. And we'll, it's you know, an honor to be with you and a true delight. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. Cheryl, I love you too. Thank you, God. I knew she was in the background. Yeah. Much love to you. Much love to you, my brother and the family. And thank you for hanging out. You're always welcome. I want you to come back. I didn't get to half the questions I want to talk about. I want you so to much we can talk about. Right. Oh, my God. We could have gone on for hours. I know we would have. But I do. I do really appreciate you. And I appreciate you so much. Truly a delight. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Like I said, if you're not inspired by this conversation with Dr. Green, I don't know what to do. Call him. Get online. Hear me. I said, I wasn't inspired. I need help. You got to need a vitamin in some way, somehow. He'll help you find inspiration out of this conversation because I'm inspired by it. I'm fired up. You're going to make my rest of my afternoon. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm just going to go out and run in circles, <laughs> I think. Thank you for being here, everybody. Remember, as I always say, go inspire somebody. It's really important. A hello is a great source of inspiration. Touches people in their heart. Uplift their spirit. Just like taking a vitamin in some ways. Giving love back to people is what we need more on this planet. You can do that. It's not hard. There's no directions for it. It just comes from right here. Make it happen. Thanks for listening. Check us out on social media where all the cool kids are. That's where we hang out, TLC underscore conversation. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Alan, I love you, brother. Cheryl, I love you too. I'll see you soon. Mutual love. See you soon. Take care, everybody.